Hey, come on, Go Church family. How you feel today? Everybody good? Oh, come on. If anybody loves Jesus, can you take five seconds here? Let's just honor the Lord together. You, oh Lord, are the reason we are here. Look at somebody right next to you and say, since the last time I saw you, I think you lost five pounds. Go ahead and lie to them in church. It's all right. Encourage somebody. Encourage them. For those of you in this room, this is our South Metro Atlanta campus, our broadcast campus. From this room, we live stream our gatherings to our Montgomery County, Maryland campus. We greet all of you and our amazing West Side campus there on the tremendous property of City of Refuge. So we greet all of you today as well. And everybody watching online, whoever you are, wherever you're watching from, we say God bless you. Okay, Go Church family all over the place. Can we greet each other together today like the first time we've ever done it? Oh, come on, somebody be thankful for the family of God. Good. All of our military men and women, first responders, let's take a moment, every campus honor you. Would you lift your hands, active duty veterans, first responders, every campus go crazy for these men and women. God bless you. Oh, no, 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 no. Come on, more than that, more than that. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Come on, a little bit more. God bless you in the back, sir. Thank you for serving. If you remember a couple of Sundays ago, it was Easter Sunday, but how many of you know Jesus is still alive? Come on. And on Easter Sunday, we did our annual Easter survey. I wanna give you one area of results on that survey card. If you remember, if you were here on that day, on the back of that survey card, I asked everybody a question. I asked, would you take a moment and mark where you are in your spiritual journey on Easter Sunday? The four boxes were as follows. A, I am already in a personal and growing relationship with Jesus. B, on Easter Sunday, I am beginning a personal and growing relationship with Jesus. C, I'm not ready. I'm not saying no, but I'm not saying yes. So I would like to see, consider it a little bit more. Or the letter D stated, I don't ever intend on making Jesus my Lord and Savior. I'm gonna give you the results of that. And the most important, we had record attendance on Easter, that's tremendous. But the most important number is the amount of people that said yes to Christ. So for those on Easter Sunday that Mark B, beginning a new relationship with Jesus, how about 316 people? Oh, come on, let's go. Woo, feel, uh, feel emotional about that. Our team and I, we, we talked about how we don't think that it's by happenstance that it would be 316 on Easter Sunday. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, he gave his one and only begotten son. So I'm very proud of that. Another part of this metric that I'm proud of is out of the 316 people, 101 of them were children. Can you say praise God to that? Come on. Good. Now I'm gonna highlight for you boxes C and D only so that you can join with me in prayer on these individuals that were brave enough and confident enough to say that they are where they are on that journey. And then together we can believe that through the power of the Lord, through the grace of God, through his love. You know, how many of you know that you and I were a C and D one time? Come on. But by the grace of God, 76 people said, I'm considering it. I'm not ready, but I'm considering it. 12 individuals said, I don't ever intend on making Jesus my Lord and Savior. So for the 88 of you, if you're here today on this Sunday, we love you. God loves you. God's got a next step for you. And the best decision that you could ever make is allowing Jesus' love to come into your heart and making you a new person. And everybody that has faith and you believe that said a good amen. Come on, can you declare that with me? All right. All right, one small item of business, cameraman, real quick. Y'all know the camera adds 10 pounds, by the way. Come on, somebody. All right, follow me real quick. I wanna impromptu here, but I wanna walk right over here to my friend, Micah Sakalis. Micah T. Sakalis. Mike and I, we have been friends for 24 years years. I met Micah in college. I was a freshman at Lee University. He had hair 24 years ago. <laughs> hair 24 years ago. Uh, during 21 days of prayer and fasting, the Lord spoke to Micah's heart that he was to move back home to Baltimore, Maryland, 
go back into the public education system, the school system. He began that conversation with me a, a couple of months ago, and uh, I hope it's okay to tell him, but on Wednesday, he signed a contract with the Baltimore County Schools to go back into education and be a music teacher, which is tremendous. How many of you know that our school system needs God-fearing men and women? So, Micah, Micah will be with us for a few more weeks serving at this campus and our West Side campus, but I just wanna speak a word over you. Your best days are in front of you, man. And the fingerprints of your anointing will forever be on Go Church. Thanks for believing in me. Uh, when we started Go Church in Maryland, it was me, Kimberly, Micah, and David Waldrop. And that was it. You've been with me ride or die from day one. And I promise that I'll be with you until Jesus comes back. I think it's appropriate at every campus we show this man of God some genuine love. Come on. Ain't none like him. I love you, man. I love you. Hey. Look at that. Look at that. Love that dude. Let me say this too. We already have a campus in Maryland. By God's grace, uh, 2024, we might be launching our Baltimore campus. So I know Mike is moving back to Baltimore. So I'm just gonna say this. You can run, but you can't hide. I'm coming for you, Micah. And I believe we'll be back together again one day. I love you from the bottom of my heart. All right, let's get into week number two of a series called Binge the Bible. Man, I was out last week. Uh, I got hit with some kind of sickness. The doctor said, it's not flu, it's not COVID, it's not strep, uh, but you got something. So one of y'all gave me something. I don't know who it was, but on Easter, all them little germs hanging around, but thank God I'm feeling better. Thank you for the prayers. Thank you to Dr. Lamb for jumping in very last minute and preaching week number one of this series. I'm fired up for today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Invite the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart. 10 seconds of concentration, focus, meditation, and then I'm gonna pray for us and we'll get into the word together. Thank you, Jesus. The Psalm says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I thank you, Lord, for giving us a word, a holy word that illuminates our paths, leading us out of darkness into your marvelous light. And it also illuminates our path to take our next steps in our faith journey, in life, in marriage, in relationships, like Micah in calling, for some in career, Whatever it may be, it is your word that brings light. And I pray that today that I would bring your word honor and glory and majesty. Lord, it's not my desire to stand up here and to try to pretend to be someone or something that I am not. But I thank you that because of the anointing of God that you place on my life, Lord, that you use somebody like me. So with great humility today, I thank you for this awesome opportunity and I give you thanks. Now, let your word penetrate to our heart and transform us <clears throat> from the inside out. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the whole church said, amen and amen. We've clapped for a lot of reasons today, none greater than Jesus. Come on, five seconds here, let's go. Come on, go church. <laughs> Woo! All right, grab you something to take notes with today. There's a message note card in a seat near you. Maybe you got your journal or your smartphone. I really genuinely want to encourage you to take some notes. Uh, we do have a, a note-taking culture here at Go Church, but a lot of scripture, a lot of thoughts today. Uh, plus, I wasn't here last Sunday, so I've not preached since Easter. So hang in there. You're going to be here till lunchtime. Come on now. You ready? Let me, let me kick off this whole idea about binging the Bible with a couple of interesting facts about scripture. And so, uh, again, most of you, you, you've got a Netflix account or you've got somebody else's login information. Come on, just be honest. It's church. And you know what it means to binge shows or episodes or anything like that on network. Some of you are like food documentary type of people. Where are you at, food people, like you've watched them all? 
Some of you are like thriller type. Y'all not gonna raise your hand like, I'm not gonna tell you what I watch on Netflix, Pastor. I'm just watching. We got security cameras seeing what you watch. Thriller documentaries. Some of you watch comedy shows. Some of you watch Love is Blind. Come on out. I don't think there's any, any area in our life more important than us binging the Bible, like really getting into God's word. And so I wanna give you some interesting thoughts or facts about the scripture. Some you may know, some you may not know. This will build our conversation. And then today I hope that in about 35 minutes I can prove to you that the Bible is right, that the Bible is true, that God's scripture, the Holy Bible, and that word holy is important because holy means set apart. So this book, pardon the grammar, bad grammar, good preaching, but this book ain't like any other book. It's a holy book, a set apart book. And I hope that today I can prove to you that it's verified, that it's authentic, it's right and it's true. But let's start with some interesting facts or statistics, you may know some of these. The Bible is the most sold book in the world, but it's also the most stolen book in the world. How many of you knew that? You already knew that one. You're like, teach me something I didn't know. And I always think about this. I mean, I get the idea of people buying the Bible, but people that are stealing the Bible. How does it work in our theology when a thief steals a Bible, reads the Bible, gives his or heart, her, their heart to the Lord, and then they get to heaven before God. How's that gonna work? I mean, I think God accepts that person, you know? At Go Church, you don't have to steal a Bible. If you don't own a Bible, we'll give you one, okay? I thought that was interesting, though. The most sold book in the world, the most stolen book in the world. Here's something else. 365 times in the Bible, there's a phrase that says, fear not. That means that's one fear not for every single day of your year. Okay, that'll preach. Let's go. 365 fear nots. So this morning, if you walked into a Go Church campus and you have great anxiety or fear, the word of the Lord says, fear not. Why? Because God is faithful and he is in control. How many have ever heard of the Wicked Bible? Anybody heard of the Wicked Bible? In 1631, printers out of London printed what they now call the Wicked Bible. What happened was during their printing process, they left out the word not in the seventh commandment. So instead of the seventh commandment reading, thou shall not commit adultery, somebody in the back is like, where do I find that Bible? <laughs> the wicked Bible says thou shall commit adultery. Now, this printing press in London, they, they were fined, they lost their printing you know, uh, certificate and opportunity to print. And of course, in 1631, the logistics of, of distribution and the thought of recollection uh, just seems overly impossible. But all of the wicked Bibles have been collected except nine of them. There are nine still out there somewhere. I saw one of them on display about three years ago in Washington, D.C. at the, the Bible Museum or the Museum of the Bible which by the way, I encourage every single Christian, even non-Christian, skeptic of the faith, to go to Washington DC, put it on your bucket list, and visit the Museum of the Bible. Absolutely fabulous. All right, let's keep going. This is a hard room to impress. Y'all looking at me like, well, I, that ain't nothing. All right, here we go. The most recent data from American Bible Society. Here, here's a few thoughts. I'll start with the first one about how Americans feel about morality in the United States. Although today's conversation is not about Christian morals or Christian ethics, although when you get into God's word, his word will shape your morals and values and ethics. But research says that 86% of Americans see a moral decline in our nation. How many of you would agree with that? You see morality on the decline. Now, why I wanted to show you that is because I wonder if there's any correlation between the decline of morality in our country and the, the decline of scripture reading in our country. Could these two, and I'm just presenting this thought for you, but is it possible that the reason that morality is rapidly declining is because less and less people are picking up God's word, which is our manual for living? So here's what the stats say, that only two in five Americans said that they've read their Bible three or more times per year. Not day, not week, not month, but year, three or four times per year. Which, by the way, uh, the American Bible Society considers people to be a Bible reader if you read your Bible three or more times in a given calendar year. And then during COVID, you would think that during a worldwide pandemic, 
more people would read the Bible, but actually 26 million people stopped reading the Bible during the pandemic. I wanna bore you with, with charts and graphs, but just one here. From 2011 to 2023, again, from the American Bible Society, you can see how in the last couple of years, how we have fallen off the edge of a cliff when it comes to reading God's word, studying scripture. His word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. That's why I think that maybe this Binge the Bible series is the most important series that I can ever do. If I can somehow challenge you and encourage you and God's, God's grace could prompt you, his Holy Spirit could prompt you to get into the word of God. Let me tell you, every scenario, every situation, every storm, every decision, every pain, every problem, every need is found in the word of God. Can I get 100 people to say amen right there? All right, so I'll, anytime I talk about the Bible, the Holy Bible, I always try to give you uh, some context around scripture. So give me, give me a few moments here to unpack this. The Bible is a collection or a compendium of 66 books. You got 39 books in the Old Testament. You have 27 books in the New Testament. Now, the chapters and verses, the numerical amounts to these chapters and verses are specific to the King James Version. There's a lot of translations of scriptures out there. I'll break, I'll break almost all of those translations of scriptures down for you next Sunday so you know which version to read. But this is the King James Version, 1,189 chapters, 31,102 verses. Kimberly counted all of these for me this week. God bless Kimberly and her dear friend Google. Come on, somebody. Now, I don't know if this is true or not, so you'll have to do some homework. But it's been said that if you calculate the 1,189 chapters and the 31,102 verses and you divide them mathematically right in the middle, the very middle of your Bible is Psalm 118, verse number eight. And here's what the word of the Lord says in the middle of the Bible. For it is better to put your confidence in God than to put your trust in a man. Speak, Lord. 40 different authors wrote the Bible. These were prophets, poets, priests, kings, farmers, fishermen. They wrote over a span of 15 centuries. They wrote from places like dungeons, palaces, prisons, deserts. They wrote in three different languages, Hebrew, Aramaic and Greek on three different continents, Asia, Africa, and Europe. And whenever I talk about the Bible in this way, it always leads me to this one question. How did they all come up with the same story? How do you take 40 authors, three languages, three continents, 1,500 years, and yet they all come up with the same story? But let me tell you to you like this, it's not on the screen, but I do wanna give you this to write down or to at least consider. It was man that held the pen, but it was God that wrote that word. Can you say amen to that? See, the author of the Bible is God. Man's not the author, they're the writers. God is the author. 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us that, that scripture, all scripture is God breathed. Jesus is the subject of the Bible. In John 5, 39, that verse says that all of the verses in the Bible point back to Jesus. Anybody grateful for Jesus? Come on. And the verb of the Bible is give. You could use John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. He gave his one and only begotten son, gave his son. Or you could use 1 John 3, 16 that says this is how we know what love is that Jesus gave up his life for us, so we also must give ourselves up for others. The author of the Bible is God. The subject of the Bible is Jesus. The verb of the Bible is give. So is this Bible then, is it verified? Is this Bible accurate? When you pick up your scripture, and I hope, and I'm gonna challenge you maybe every day, is it trustworthy? Is it just a New York Times bestseller or is it really holy and set apart? 
Psalm 33, verse number four says it like this, that the word of the Lord is right and true. How? How, how can you defend, although the gospel of Jesus doesn't need you to defend it, but how can you defend the scripture in conversation or in your faith journey to declare that, man, the word of God is right and true. Well, let me just talk to you like this way. If, if you ever want to determine if something is both right and true, you have to look at the evidence. So what does the evidence say? Let's start there. I, I, would, I would suggest this, that first you have to look at historical evidence. Is the Bible historically verified? Now, a lot of people, whenever they start to read the Bible, or, or depending on when you read Scripture, at any point in your faith journey, you're going to have some questions. You're going to have some thoughts. And you're going to wonder, is, is this really a genuine, true, authentic, accurate, historical document? I mean, when I read stories about guys like Simon Peter getting out of the boat and walking on water, that, that's not humanly possible, or when I read about people like Lazarus and even Jesus, that they were dead and yet God raised them back to life. I mean, come on, that's not humanly possible. You ever read the story about Jonah and the big fish where he spent three days and three nights in the belly of a fish? That's not humanly possible. Neither is a virgin giving birth to a child. That's not humanly possible. And let me say to those of you that are skeptical of this being a historical document because of the stories that aren't humanly possible, you're right. They're not humanly possible. But with God, all things are possible. Come on, can I get 50 people that would say amen right there? So, so how then can you, because these stories, many of them don't seem humanly possible, then how can you verify the historical accuracy? Well, anytime you do a good history test, you ask three questions. Were there eyewitness accounts? I mean, just go to the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. These were guys that lived with Jesus. They walked with Jesus. They talked with Jesus. They, they ate with Jesus. They did life with Jesus. They played Uno with Jesus. Like they lived with Jesus. So they weren't writing the Gospels based off of like, you know, a, a third-party eyewitness or second-hand information. They were writing from their own experience what they had seen and what they had, had, had experienced and what they had felt and the miracles that happened right in front of them. Of course there were eyewitness accounts. People aren't just writing about stories they never knew of. Was this historical document recorded and copied with accuracy or extreme care. How about this? When you think of the writings of, of, of Plato, Aristotle, Homer, Caesar, you get a few hundred manuscripts. But when you think about the original manuscripts of the Bible, over 25,000 manuscripts. Now, it's not just about the, the quantity of manuscripts, although in comparison, the manuscripts of God's word far supersede the manuscripts of, of a man's writing, but also the quality of the manuscripts. It's no wonder that, that God would have chosen the Jewish people to record and copy his word because they were some of the most meticulous, uh, perfectionist type of people on the planet. If you, if you go to the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and, 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 and the Jewish people in their recording, they didn't record the manuscript word for word. They recorded it letter by letter, and they would take the middle letter of every word, and they would verify its accuracy five letters forward and five letters backwards. You better believe that this has been recorded and copied with extreme care. And then, or are there any discoveries? I was talking to somebody after the first gathering and, and, and it is on my bucket list to visit the Holy Land. I've never been. I would love to go in 2024. Would anybody go with me to the Holy Land? I'd love to go. Now, before you say, yeah, you gotta pay your way, I can't pay you. Just making sure you're just like, it's, it's your own bill, all right? But when you look at the archeological digs, that happen in the Middle East. There are hundreds and hundreds 
of archaeological confirmations that back up the, the verification and the accuracy and the trustworthiness of God's word. Now, now if, if thousands of archaeological findings don't, don't help you to understand that God's word is right and true, then let's think about it from this angle. There's never been one discovery archaeologically that's ever been able to contradict not one single verse of the Bible. Not one find can contradict God's word. Yet thousands of findings back up the evidence of the Holy Scripture. Man, you guys are looking at me like, teach me something I don't already know. All right, let's try this one then. So we talked about the historical verification, but what about the science? Man, during the pandemic, if you and I had a dollar for every time we heard somebody say, trust the science, we'd be like a millionaire. Now, I'm not gonna get into all of that. I, I thank God that medication and science is available to us, or we probably wouldn't be here. But let me ask you this question. All, you, you've gotta participate, okay? I wanna talk to everybody that's been out of high school 20 years or more. All right, you've been out of high school 20 years or more, every campus, raise your hand real quick, come on. Some of you are like, I've been out so long, what do you say? Why is everybody raising their hand? All right, hands down. For those of you who've been out of high school 20 years or more, every time that you have a specific need, how many of you, when you, let's call it a health need, and you go to your doctor, your primary care, or your specialist, and they give you information and medication about treatment, procedure, whatever. How many of you, 20 years or more out of high school, you ask them, now, do you wanna see my high school science book? Because I just wanna make sure that it matches my high school science book. When's the last time you checked your high school science book for validity? Never, why? Listen, don't miss this. Because science evolves, thank God. Science evolves, but absolute truth never changes. Now, okay, you, you can go to Paris and visit a whole library of obsolete science books. In 1861, the French Academy of Science wrote, there are 51 incontrovertible scientific facts that prove that the Bible is wrong. 51 in 1861. Now, in April of 2023, all 51 of these incontrovertible scientific facts proving the Bible is wrong, They've been converted. They've been disproven. It was Voltaire who said, within 100 years, the Bible will be completely forgotten. Now, we've not forgotten the Bible, but who is Voltaire? <laughs> I have no idea. Why? Because your word says, Psalm 148, watch, 48, verses five and six, let every created thing give praise to the Lord for he issued his word. He gave his command and they came into being. He set them in place for how long? Forever and ever and his decree will never be revoked. That's a great place for the believers of the word to say amen right there. Come on, let's go. But let's talk about science because this is important. For over 2,000 years, people believed that the earth was flat. And some of you believe that the earth is flat. Because you were like, well, I saw a map and the map was flat. <laughs> you're gonna get that joke at lunch and you're gonna appreciate the comedy that I bring. The earth was flat. But if you think about it, uh, Copernicus, Galileo, Columbus, those are the big names of individuals that theorized that the earth is not flat, that the earth is round. Yet 2,600 years ago, it was Isaiah, as recorded in Isaiah 40, 22, that declared God sits enthroned above the circle of the earth. Scientifically proven 2,600 years ago. When, when God was writing the Holy Bible through the penmanship of man. During that era, there was a prevailing thought in the Bible writing times that the earth had to be held up. And some of the most brilliant minds believed this. Greeks, Egyptians, Hindus, 
They all believed that somehow, some way, the earth could not just be suspended and rotate on its axis, but someone or something had to hold it up. So the Greeks believed that it was a giant by the name of Atlas, and Atlas held the globe on his shoulders. It was the Egyptians who believed, brilliant people by the way, that the earth was suspended by five strategic pillars holding up the corners of the earth. The Hindus for thousands of years believed that two giant elephants standing on the backs of two giant turtles swimming on the back of one giant sea monster was holding up the earth. Yet if you go back to one of the oldest chapters and books of the Bible, you go to Job. What does Job say? He spreads out the northern sky over empty space and he suspends the earth over nothing. Your word is right and true and it is verified. It is accurate. It is trustworthy. All right, let's look at the, the, the Greek astronomer Hipparchus and the Egyptian astronomer Ptolemy. Now, these two individuals declared that the number of the stars could be counted. So Hipparchus went outside one evening and he counted 1,022 stars in the sky. Hundreds of years later, Ptolemy came on the scene and he said, actually, my friend Hipparchus missed four stars. There's 1,026 stars in the sky. If you'll do this without getting distracted, any one of you can Google right now how many stars are in the galaxy. You know what Google says? 200 billion trillion stars. But Jeremiah said, ooh, the stars of the sky cannot be counted. Can we pause right here? Come on, help me preach. The Bible is historically verified. The Bible is scientifically verified. But how about thematically, Pastor JC? Um, does the Bible contradict itself? From Genesis to Revelation, 66 books, do they write in uniformity? And do they write in harmony? Do they write in a like mind? I'll go back to a slide I showed you earlier, but I'll I'll summarize it just to remind you, I wanna make sure you know this, that the Holy Bible was written over 1,500 years in over a dozen countries on three continents by 40 people in three languages. How, how can God's word with all of these differences be thematically unified and verified? They didn't write or speak the same language. They came from different backgrounds and ethnicities and walks of life. If, we, if today we played the old telephone game, and I, I started right here with Justin, and I said, Justin, here's a sentence. Now pass that sentence all the way left until everybody in this room got that sentence. Then make sure you get it to Westside. Make sure you get it to Montgomery County and everybody watching online and give me back the message. Y'all would mess the whole thing up. So how can 1,500 years of time and dozen countries, three continents, 40 people, three different languages, how can it be thematically verified? Because listen, this isn't other like religious books or texts. This is the Holy Bible. It's set apart. Look at me real quick. Of course the Quran has thematic unification. It was written by one man, Muhammad, of course the Analects of Confucius have consistency and theme unification, was written by one person. Of course the writings of Buddha have thematic unification and accuracy. One person, but your Bible, 1,500 years, dozens of countries, three continents, three languages, 40 different people. How? Only because. It was breathed by God. Some years ago, I showed you an image. I, I saw it one day on an article or doing some study or maybe on a social, new, social media news feed. I don't remember where I saw it initially, but I showed you this image years ago and I want you to see this image again. 
It is one of the most breathtaking, powerful visual images of thematic unification and verification in scripture that I have ever seen. It's unbelievable. Why? Because from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, there are 63,779 cross references in your Bible. Meaning that these different writers would cross reference one another over a span of 1,500 years, three continents, three languages. Okay, 63,779 cross references. Now, on the image, on the, bottom, on the bottom of the image, there is a gray or white bar. These represent every single book and chapter in your Bible. The lines above it, the colored lines above it, show you the cross reference imagery to really provide for you just this full confidence that the scripture is verified, it's accurate, and you can trust it. And listen, I talk a lot. God's given me the gift of gab, all right? I'm gonna show you this image. They're gonna put it on the screen and I'm just gonna shut my mouth for about 10 seconds. You ready? Look at this. Thank you, Jesus for your word. Isn't that powerful? Okay. So, in my opinion, I, I believe that scripture is historically verified, it's scientifically verified, it's thematically verified, but, but what about prophecy? Is it prophetically verified? What, in the simplest definition of prophecy, what does that mean? I'll give it to you. This is just Simple. A prophecy is simply a prediction. So it's predicting something in the, in the now that will happen at a later date. Does that make sense? So when you read your Bible from cover to cover, you'll see that there are 2,500 prophecies in the Bible. Now watch this. As of today, 2,000 of them have already been fill, filled to the letter with no errors at all. Now let me pause right here. Some of you are like, well, what about the other 500 prophecies? Well, the remaining 500 prophecies all point to the second coming of Jesus in the last days, the return of Christ, which means that for many of us, you know, we, uh, we never experienced the fulfillment of the 2,000 prophecies. But for you, for your children, for your grandchildren, for your great-grandchildren, they could see the final 500 prophecies come to fulfillment in their lifetime. Now watch this. 2,500 prophecies, 2,000 of them have already been fulfilled to the very letter, no errors. So the odds for all of those prophesying having been fulfilled by chance, not by God, but by chance, with no error is less than one in 10 to the 2,000th power. That's 10 followed by 2,000 zeros, by the way. Let me give you an image. It would be like the state of Texas being filled with silver dollars, two feet in deep, two feet in depth, rather, over the entire state of Texas, all right? One coin is a red silver dollar coin. And then I pick you to parachute you into Texas. You land in the silver dollars and you got one guess at finding the red coin. Only God. How about this? In one day, in one day, Jesus himself fulfilled no fewer than 28 specific prophecies spoken at least 500 years earlier about him. Hey, I hope that, is everybody good? We're good? Okay, because I'm just trying to tell you that your Bible is verified, it's accurate, and you can trust it. In one day, Jesus himself fulfills 28 of those prophecies. Now, my brain isn't smart enough to memorize all 28, so I'm gonna read them to you. Do you have time for me to read them? It didn't matter your response, I was going to read them. I was, truth be told. Here we go. He will be betrayed by a friend. 
Psalm 41, 9, Matthew 26, 49. The price of his betrayal will be 30 pieces of silver. Zechariah eleven twelve Matthew 26, 15. His betrayal money will be cast to the floor of the temple. Zechariah eleven thirteen Matthew 27, 5. His betrayal money will be used to buy the potter's field. Zechariah eleven thirteen Matthew 27, 7. He will be forsaken and deserted by his disciples. Zechariah 13, 7, Matthew 27, 7. He will be accused by false witnesses. Psalm 35, 11, Matthew 26, verses 59 and 60. He will be silent before his accusers. Isaiah 53, 7, Matthew 27, 12. He will be wounded and bruised. Isaiah 53, 5, Matthew 27, 26. He will be hated without cause. Psalm 69, 4, John 15, 25. He will be struck and spit on. Isaiah 56, Matthew 26, 67. He will be mocked, ridiculed, and rejected. Isaiah 53, 3, Matthew 27, verses 27 through 31. And John chapter 7, verses 5 and 48. He will collapse from weakness. Psalm 109, verses 24 and 25, Luke 23, 26. He will be uh, taunted with specific words. Psalm 22, 6 through 8, Matthew 27, 39 through 43. People will shake their heads at him. Psalm 109, 25, Matthew 27, 39. People will stare at him. Psalm 22, 17, Luke 23, 35. He will be uh, executed among sinners. Isaiah 53, 12, Matthew 27, 38. His hands and feet will be pierced. Psalm twenty two sixteen, 16, Luke 23, 33. He will pray for his persecutors. Isaiah 53, 12, Luke 23, 34. His friends and family will stand far away from him and watch. Psalm 38, 11, Luke 23 through 49. His garments will be divided up and awarded by the casting of lots. Psalm 22, 18. John 19, 23 and 24. He will thirst. Psalm 69, 21. John 19, 28. So they'll give him vinegar to drink. Psalm 69, 21. Matthew 27, 34. He will commit himself to God. Psalm 31, 5 and 23, 46. His bones will be left unbroken. Psalm 34, 20, John 19, 33. Three or four more, watch. His side will be pierced. Zechariah 12, 10, John 19, 34. Darkness will come over the land at midday. Amos 8, 9, Matthew 27, 45. He will be buried in a rich man's tomb. Isaiah 53, 9, Matthew 27, verses 57 through 60. And the last one, 28 prophecies in one day. What kind of God? Who is this man? It's Jesus, watch, he will die 483 years after the declaration of Artaxerxes to rebuild the temple in the year 444 BC, Daniel 924. Let's pause and give God the highest praise. Come on. Oh, come on, church. Thy word, thy word. There is no other kind of book like this book. And in every area, it is accurate, it is verified, and it is trustworthy. Except maybe one. And that's personally. because only you can discover that. I can't give you facts about that one, about you. Only about me. Thank you, Lord. And we take it for granted I know I do. Just for a moment, I'm really genuinely almost done, but would you just close your eyes and just thank God for his word to you and for you? Just 
Just eyes closed for just a moment here. Come on. You're busy. Life is a lot. You're always on the go. You got places to be and people to see. But your word says that he is a jealous God. And he just wants time with you. He wants to speak to you and reveal his glory to you and, and encourage you and equip you and empower you. I hear people say all the time, Pastor, I see God's not speaking to me. He's always speaking through his word. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Look at me real quick. If I had for you today some magic mirror that I could present to you, and when you look in this magic mirror, it reveals everything about you, your past, your present, your future. This magic mirror could tell you where you've been, and it'll tell you where it's going. This magic mirror could reveal your weaknesses, your insecurities, your propensities towards doing wrong. This magic mirror could show you every flaw, but also point out every gift and ability and all the good things in you. How much would you pay for that magic mirror? $1,000? $5,000? If you had the means $100,000, would you pay for a magic mirror that could reveal everything about you and your future and your children and your purpose? Well, I don't have a magic mirror. But did you know that the scripture says that God's word is like a mirror? And I say this all the time, listen to me. You think whenever you pick this up, you think you're reading the Bible? No, friend, the Bible is reading you. And when you open it, this mirror reveals things to you and about you, and most importantly, about his glory. And if you would just, I'll give you one more slide and then I'll pray for you. If you would just read your Bible four times a week, just four times a week, watch what statistics say, watch. Four times a week in the word of God, loneliness drops by 30%. Four times a week, standing on the word of God, anger drops by 32%. Bitterness drops by 40%. Alcoholism drops by, by 47%. Stagnation drops by 60%. The addiction to pornography drops by 60%. Whatever it is that you're walking through, whatever it is that's got you bound, whatever it is that's got you tied up, Jesus said this, if you hold to my teaching, that's how you become one of my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Come on, if we're gonna clap, let's do it well. Come on. If you know the truth, the truth will set you free. Every campus, read this together. One, two, three. If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, every head bowed, every eye closed. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your word. Come on. I worship you, Jesus. I give you glory and I give you honor. Give us a burning passion to get into the word of God. And someone here today, I'm not just encouraging you to know about the God in the Bible. I'm challenging you to know the God of the Bible. 
I'm not trying to teach you to know about him intellectually with your mind, but yet, or rather experientially with your heart to make him Lord of all. Every campus, if that's you today, I don't just wanna know you with my head, but I wanna know you in my heart to let you, Christ Jesus, sit on the throne of my life, forgiving me of my sin and making me a new creation. On the count of three, hands go up, committing my life to Christ for the very first time or recommitting my heart to the Lord. One, two, three, come on, hands up. Keep them up for a moment. For just a second, from left to right, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. Anybody else? Come on. 14. Lord, for every hand that was lifted, here's what we're saying. We don't want to know about you in our head. We want to know you in our heart. Everyone pray this prayer. Dear Lord, I'm inviting you into my life to forgive me of my sin. I'm asking you to make me a new person, changing me from the inside out. I want to know the truth so that truth can set me free. So I invite you, Lord, to come into my mind, come into my heart, and come into my life. Because the word says, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said amen and amen. Come on, church family, for the 14 people at this campus, let's go. Come on.